Chairman, Chief Curator, on behalf of the board and the staff, we'd like to welcome you here today. We have the great privilege to be having Tony Ursler talk about his exhibition and walk us through all three of the galleries. I'm just going to give you a little brief introduction uh, before we start and pass it over to Tony. Uh, Tony is a pioneer of installation and multimedia art since the late 1970s. He has developed an experimental and innovative practice that utilizes projection, optical devices, audio, video, and sculpture to move images away from the white wall and onto the unexpected surfaces or environments. Employing conceptual dramaturgy, VR, 3D, stop motion, and live action, Ursula draws inspiration from pop cultural and fringe phenomena while frequently referring to science and technological advances to create a dialogue between perception and communication. Fresh off his dynamic public art commission, Tears of the Cloud, which was on view on Riverside Park this past October, we are delighted to showcase Tony's work in the entire museum to delve into the subject of water and magical thinking as it relates to the East End. Water Memory features the first presentation of a new process of projection on mist that the artist has worked on creating and mastering over the past 18 years. Through his inventive technological approach, Ursula explores the ubiquitous elements of water as a repository for belief systems with references to the range of sea monsters, evil spirits, to cartography, and the claimed ability of water memory. Tony lives and works in New York City and on the North Fork, and he has just returned from a major commission in Tasmania. Uh, I do want to also thank our sponsors on page two. <laughs> uh, we really want to thank our lead sponsor, Mark Haas Foundation, the co-sponsors, Bluebird Philanthropies, Kathleen McDonough and Edward Berman, of the Rosencrantz Foundation and George Wells, additional exhibition support by Nina Yankwitz and Barry Holden. Uh, free admission to the museum is sponsored by Landscape Design and BNB Bank, so please come often. A special thank you to Jenny and Trey and the Laird and the Lehman Mopin Foundation. Sarah Levine is here, I know, today, Sarah. Great, terrific. Thank you so much for all of their wonderful help. I want to say a personal thank you to Casey DeLean, the curatorial assistant registrar, and Joe Brando, uh, the technical director, uh, who oversaw the complete installation with Kelly. <laughs> Well, I was at my son's wedding, so I want to really thank them so much from the bottom of my heart for doing this. So uh, please be careful because we do have projectors on the floor, so when we're walking around the room, just be aware. And when we get into the other room, we have the box that are made out of blown glass, so just be careful as you're walking around the room. So without further ado, Tony. Ah, thanks so much. Hi, everybody. Uh, so happy to be here at the museum of uh, Guild Hall Museum and to uh, in these amazing rooms yes. that were. Yeah. Okay. Come, come closer. Come closer. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so happy to be here in the uh, in the hollowed halls of Guild Hall, which were. When was this place redone? Like re. Uh, dozen years ago. The floors are one year old. Oh, the floors are one year old. Well, they do, there's something just incredible about the way everything is preserved, yet kind of updated here. And that was one of the great feelings uh, that, that uh, transmitted into the space, you know, these lovely three spaces to work together with. And, um, you know, a lot of my work comes out of uh, research. If you're familiar with my, uh, my artwork, I kind of delve into different topics and then see where it leads me. And that's the way I've been, been uh, following my trajectory as an artist through many years, you know, whether it's through, uh, you know, uh, media culture or and its relationship to pop cultural phenomenons like uh, multi-personality uh, inventory tests and uh, multiple personality disorder and uh, like that. And uh, so I, you know, I can probably just answer a few questions about uh, my history for those of you who are uh, new to my work. I started, people often ask me, well, how did you start getting involved with video? And I'll say, well, 
you know, I, I began as a painter and um, sculptor as a kid. And, you know, I, and then by the time I started to get serious about it, I felt like there was something missing. And, um, you know, it turned out that that was the moving image. And uh, so, you know, being a kind of member of what I guess would be the TV generation, and then, you know, where I grew up with uh, the moving image in the house, you know, which a lot of people here did. And then, of course, bridging into the internet age. And thinking about art, you know, my generation thinks about art as a kind of a way of, uh, of expressing ideas and interacting with the culture in the sense that, um, you know, I'm kind of interested in, uh, in the vernacular, you know, and I thought it was kind of strange, you know, when I was a young artist that, that, that there wasn't more moving image present in, in video, I mean, in, in the museums and in art galleries and so forth. And since then, you know, there's been a, an incredible arc where, you know, videos come in and out of fashion, and now I think it's kind of out of fashion, but, you know, some of us <laughs> still work, toil away in it. And, um, but you can see the traces of, you know, my interest in working with, with these kind of, you know, squeezing these mediums inside out, you know. So I, I've always been kind of taking the, moving image and turning it into a still image or vice versa and uh, like that. So that's just a little bit of background. And this particular project, um, as Christina mentioned in her uh, lovely introduction, kind of came out of a long research project that I was doing related to uh, the water systems around the Northeast, specifically the Hudson River, which I grew up on. Uh, in a little town called Nyack, and uh, the people know that town, yeah, okay. And uh, so that, that was a, a, the kind of inspiration to look at that, uh, the river as a kind of um, metaphor, as a kind of cultural uh, engine, as a metaphor for s some of the kind of activities, whether they were narrative or uh, engineering or uh, pop cultural phenomenons along there. And so I kind of picked a, a lot of uh, uh, points along the Hudson that were important to me and uh, looked at, you know, the invention of the uh, computer chip and, uh, and, and basically the, the developments uh, of telecommunication uh, with, with um, the Morse code, and one of the great inspirations, if you follow the Hudson all the way up, you can kind of pinpoint, you know, uh, areas, whether it be West Point or Olana or Nyack, where Edward Hopper uh, and Thomas Wilfred were. Do you all know Thomas Wilfred? All right, well, that's one thing I can mention to you today, that you got to go home and look up Thomas Wilford, because I didn't really know who he was, uh, even though he, what, I was living in Nyack as a little kid when he was still alive. Uh, he was a guy who did kind of moving image kinetic light sculptures. And those of you who might be around 60 or so may remember uh, there was a moving image kind of light display in the coat room, right near the coat room at MoMA for until 1985, I think it was. Anyway, that was a Thomas Wilford work. And he's since kind of re-emerged, he made these fantastic uh, sculptures with ever-changing kind of light boxes uh, that, anyway, he was uh, also, as Joseph Cornell was from Nyack too. See, I'm bragging about my hometown, so. But I discovered Thomas Wilford was from West, he, was, he lived in West Nyack, so, and he used to open his studio up to people. So I imagine when I was a kid, you know, my mom probably wandered, took me in there. So I'm going to say that happened, but it's really made up. But uh, anyway, so 
Uh, one of the th great inspirations about that, this corridor, and I'm going to take a poetic license and connect the Hudson River uh, as a um, pathway, you know, leading up to the Adirondacks and the Hudson River School of Painters, who you may have heard of. People heard of them? Yes. Yeah, okay, great. Um, so the Hudson River School was uh, landscape painters that were inspired by, obviously, the Hudson River and, and a kind of bucolic, idyllic landscape. Uh, and there were kind of two sides to it. With my work, there's always a couple of sides to things. And, and with the uh, Hudson River School, there was certainly a downside to the, to the fact that uh, the painters largely ignored uh, the people who were here before them and painted idyllic uh, landscapes of, that, that America could identify with, but as basically a kind of... Uh, heavenly uh, transcendental space for kind of projection of, of the immigrants who came from Europe and landed in New York area and came, uh, came all along uh, the shores of the East Coast and kind of painted these wonderful landscapes which stirred, uh, you know, the burgeoning countries, um, stirred the enthusiasm for the potential of the lands of America, uh, ignoring the fact that we were all immigrants coming to this land and that there were um, people already living here for millions a long, long time. Time in memoriam, as my friends at the, uh, new, the group, the New Red Order call it. Uh, time in memoriam. Anyway, so uh, thinking about that, and kind of researching the somewhat tedious but beautiful landscape painters, uh, you know, and thinking, you know, you gotta like get a grip on that. I also discovered that they were really largely responsible for one of the first political movements in art, which was the fact that they uh, got people to identify with the landscape so much that uh, the national park systems basically were developed to protect the land. And, uh, and, and so I, I really thought about that as a kind of inspiration for what it is to be an artist and the way that artists work. That sometimes you go forward and you don't really know what the results are going to be, but you have to just keep going forward. And those painters who were a little bit out of step with what would be considered the avant-garde at the time, they were a bit more than a little bit out of step, actually had a great consequence in their work in that they developed people's consciousness to uh, think about protecting the land. Uh, so, you know, that kind of duality, I think, and it, it is an interesting jumping off point for looking at the culture along the Hudson. And, and I'm going to take poetics license, as I said, which I'm going to take tons of poetic license. So don't take anything too seriously that I say here, uh, because I'm going to make a leap and say that, you know, we can connect that waterway all the way out here uh, to, to, the, to the north and south forks of Long Island. And, and to this room, in fact, and to the beginning of this exhibition, which, uh, you know, when we began talking about this as a kind of ex extension of that project and a kind of, uh, it would, the tear of the cloud that Christina mentioned, uh, well, I was thinking a lot about water as a metaphor for um, the way that we think about things, the way we believe in things, and a kind of trace for uh, mythology, also uh, by sort of biochemical traces, and uh, poetry, uh, for lack of a better <coughs> word. So this particular room, uh, I'm going to talk about these pieces because I imagine the kind of, you know, there's a lot of talk these days about uh, global warming and the rising of sea levels. And I kind of was equating that to 
uh, the debate around its existence and magical thinking and, and basically uh, kind of telecommunications uh, in the present day as a means of, of giving us a kind of wash of information, you know, th thinking about people at a, at a moment where you're, you're able to, I mean, I grew up in an age where, you know, if somebody had the uh, encyclopedia, it was a kind of big deal. So you'd go over to your friend's house and they'd have a world book encyclopedia and you'd go back to your house and say like, dad, like, what's up? You know, they have it, we don't have it, you know. And then you'd say, like, well, it's out of date, you know. It goes out of date every couple of years, so just go to the library and get it. But thinking about today, when you have that just at your fingertips, you know, and, and what that means to have any kind of amount of information at your fingertips and how this has become a kind of... Uh, struggle for people because it's also a responsibility to live in this absolute deluge of uh, information. And so these pieces, which were made with uh, blown glass and uh, resin and uh, metal, kind of were my response to that. I, I was thinking about... Uh, yeah, so I think I'll just leave it at that. But I thought maybe the way we'd do this is since we're going to go into the next room, that we could have some questions about this room uh, here. Does that make sense? So if people have questions, yeah. Well, I work with a great team at Urban Glass, if people are, oh, yeah. yeah, so that's a right local, uh, you know, Hudson River School team of glass makers in, uh, in, in Brooklyn, and uh, Bill Kogan was uh, one of the main glass artists that I work with, and we got together, so what we would do is make a form and then take the molten glass out of the furnace and blow it in different ways and then actually press it onto the surface of this, you know, without roasting it too much and then letting it cool and then gluing it back into place. Thank you. And the material that the holding shapes, the head shapes or whatever you want to call them. That's aqua resin. This gentleman over here has just said something about the Four Noble Truths. Mm. Are you involved in Buddhism as well? Well, no, no, I'm not, but I have plenty of friends who are. Okay, but, um, Donnie. Uh, that's a, my friend Don Christensen asked the question, where do the actors come from? And uh, the actors, their performers come from in these pieces. And a lot of times they're, they're um, friends, other artists, performance artists, or just people I like the way they look or sound. And sometimes they're professional, um, professional performers, I guess. Uh, Jim Fletcher is featured over here, and uh, Jason uh, Scott Henderson over there. But as you might notice, we used a kind of morphing in the faces here. And I was thinking a lot about how, you know, in the information age, you pass ideas from one person to the next to the next, and that we sort of take on characteristics of, of people we connect with in different ways. And I was trying to transmit that with these pieces in the sense that as you're watching these faces, they'll use a computer morph, which is a interpolation, they call it, a kind of algorithm which blends one face into the next. So the actors, it, it's not just one character. And there, that one just changed to uh, my friend Sakshi. And uh, 
So I work with a lot of. Uh, is there a script or is it yeah, supervised? That's a great question. Is there a script? Uh, there is a script for better or worse with these pieces, and they're pretty much, um, I call them uh, poems, but the way I work with them is I'll sort of layer them in the sense almost like. Don's a great musician, and, and I like to think of these almost musically, the way they combine in the room, in the sense that if you have, you sort of listen to different parts, and then as, as uh, so would have it that they kind of phase with each other because they're in, they're, everything doesn't play like in one stream, so. This one may go for five minutes. Uh, and it, it, in other words, they're playing at different times and they loop at different times so that they sort of recombine in different ways, which is an old kind of strategy for, for mixing things. But it, it, it it's got, gives it a kind of sense of uh, rewriting itself is what I'm trying to get at. So in other words, the script is really, or the poems are really half there in the sense that my feeling is that you're going to finish the script in your head, if possible, you know. So I write along a, a kind of a line uh, related to, the, to this particular project, as I mentioned, information overload, follow that along a path, and then recombine those different perspectives that I have in that and then work them into the edit. So they, I start out one way, but then I kind of let the piece surprise me in a sense, you know. Um, this is just a technical question, going back to how these pieces are constructed. I didn't understand how you did that. <laughs> you mean the, the, the actual construction, the, the glass and the... Okay, and so there's a question about how they're actually constructed. So we make a kind of uh, egg, like an egg form, like a head form. And then I would take out of resin. Yeah, it's a kind of, uh, well, yeah, it's like a two-part solution that hardens up pretty hard with different layers. And then what I'll do is I then actually take that to the glass shop. So I'll have this big egg and then at the glass shop, I'll say like, well, let's try this one because I thought I wanted each one of these to have a kind of different color, just somehow thinking about a way to organize them in a spectrum. And so it's like, well, let's try a purple. You know, we're going to do a purple today. And uh, so we mix up the glass and actually it's a kind of melted sand, if you can believe that. That's what glass is so and then you heat it up to I don't know over a thousand degrees I'm just gonna make up a number 10 million degrees no I think it's it's hot enough to melt and so it comes together in this way and then we we use uh, then it gets weird because you use this thing called the glory hole so you put the you know and then you turn it around and then out it comes and you blow air into it, it blows up into a bubble. We cut it and then press it onto the egg. So you have like a, yeah, it's like a bubble that gets opened up and pressed onto the egg to have the effect that the thing is just dripping, you know, because I wanted it to look like something was just coming out of the sky and landed on, on the character, but that it was a little bit science fiction-y, you know, so it was transparent and uh, was a little bit, um, so that's, if you work with glass, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's difficult to get things to look simple, and, um, but they were really good at urban glass at doing that, so we spent a lot of time there. With that. So when we were laying out the uh, exhibition, you know, I thought of that room as a kind of more cerebral space. And, and then this room here would have a, 
a play between these two different elements, which are the uh, ink blots uh, and the robots, or the bots as I call them. And so I was thinking a lot about artificial intelligence and um, facial recognition. And there's a piece here uh, that relates to facial recognition systems from a couple of years ago. I started a, a series. Um, are people familiar with facial recognition? Yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit more about it. Uh, it's one of my favorite subjects uh, in the past couple of years. And as I mentioned, I always develop my work through research, and that's where I get the ideas for the images or the texts or the installations. And so with this one, uh, you know, with facial recognition, when it first began, there were a lot of different companies competing with the algorithms to figure out how to, how to, how to recognize one person's face out of the whole planet, you know, to see what individual matrix or what, sorry, metrics were uh, considered to be your identity, for lack of a better word. So, and the idea of kind of taking that and reducing it down to an algorithm that could be very quickly uh, transposed onto someone's face, and of course, you know what I'm talking about, you go to the ATM or you have your uh, license or something like this, or you go to the airport, and these are the first uses of, um, of facial recognition. And first I was wondering, well, how does that happen? And the way that, that they're able to do it is to take a couple of cardinal points that theoretically, God willing, everybody has, uh, and that don't actually change. Now, I know on my face they seem to have been changing quite a bit. <laughs> But I like the idea that there's a few things that stay the same. I don't believe it, but uh, there they are. There you have it. So a few things never change. And then they can say, OK, you know, that's uh, you. And these are your numbers. And this is the relationships of those points. But beyond that, that's a pretty amazing thing in itself. But beyond that, it what makes that different than, than a portrait that came before that, you know? Because I started to think, well, this is a portrait. You know, this is a kind of new portrait. And, okay, what's interesting about it is that it's being made by a machine. And it may be one of the first times that there is a portrait being made en masse of people by a machine. So it's a perspective, even though it's designed by humans, it's really a machine's way of looking at you. And what makes that different? Well, there's a couple of things that make that different. One is that, um, what does a machine think of you? Well, that's a good question right there. What do you think of the machine? And these questions start tumbling forth. Uh, one of the things that's fascinating about that is that you, it's not just the way you look anymore, because the machine doesn't really care about how you look but it is the data collected around you that makes your portrait. So it's this kind of new portrait in the sense that it's connecting to a massive uh, uh, data sets that interconnect whether, now what do I mean by that? I'm talking about what you buy online, your economic profile, your what things that you might watch on, on uh, YouTube or, or Netflix or whatever, your educational history, or did I mention your financial, medical, blah, 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 that all the stuff that's supposed to be private that, well, I guess it just leaks out of Facebook or gets hacked by somebody and then actually it does get aggregated. That's the term they use aggregation for, um, for building this portrait. And I thought, well, that's pretty interesting in the, in the sense that that's a new portrait, that it's not just about the way you look, it's about this information. And I started to think, well, that 
is kind of, you know, it, it's worthy of, of making some, some paintings, some video paintings around that. And th that, this piece here is uh, one of those from a few years ago. And I, I worked on that for some years and it was interesting that, uh, y you know, there was a ramp up because I obviously read some science magazines and things and try to keep up with tech. And now everybody knows about facial recognition. And um, so there's a, there's a kind of ramp up with that. What does it mean? That's the question. You know, my work is not really about telling people uh, what it means, but the idea of a, of a machine looking back at you and you looking at a machine has inspired me for a long time. And I have a kind of approach to that here with some of the bots. And you've probably been reading about some of the bots that move their way around the internet. Have people read about that? Yeah, search engines, bots that go and, and do different things that, have, that target uh, economics or, or politics or, um, and, and the like. And, but also, there's, you have the other side of it, which is Siri. People know about Siri. And what are the other ones? There's a f Alexa. Alexa, yeah. And Alex, is there an Alex too, or is it just Alexa? Uh, and so, <laughs> so, you know, I thought about um, how these characters would want to enter the world in different ways, because there was, uh, if, if people watched uh, 30 Rock a couple of years ago, there was a great thing called the, uh, um, the Uncanny Valley which is a, a computer scientist from the 60s talked about how eventually there'll be a uh, robot that will become more and more like us. And this be is a metaphor because in the 60s, people started to think, well, the robots are going to look like us. Well, it turns out that really the robots look like the internet, which doesn't look like anything. It just looks like a bunch of stuff flying around on the screen. But that's really, in my mind, is the kind of offloading of consciousness that, that um, Kurzweil and media theorists talk about in terms of um, future AI and so if you want to say where the mirror, the digital mirror of humanity is right now, it's obviously on the internet because we have, if you imagine, if you imagine a head and you think about, um, you know, the early days of psychology, you would look at this thing they called phrenology. Do you, everybody know about phrenology? It's a kind of humorous and beautiful thing uh, where people represented, you know, they would say like romance is here, you know, and violence is here and, and bliss is here and so forth on the, on the head. And we, you know, that's one of the early depictions of isolating human consciousness and looking at it followed by Freud and Jung and all the other wonderful people who have explored consciousness. But today, I'd say I put my money on the internet as, as a pretty much a mirror of consciousness. Uh, but I still like the idea of, of a machine somehow gaining, you know, gaining its independence and, uh, and relating to us in different ways. So I designed these bots, which they look a bit like puppets uh, that have bubble heads and uh, faces, which are kind of composite faces. And I wanted to uh, think about, you know, what they might say and do. They pretty much hang out and try to convince you of various things. And uh, the idea is that, that eventually they'll probably become, um, you know, art, they'll have artificial intelligently triggered uh, responses in them which we're working on feverishly in the studio. But, but right now, they're just randomly edited to give the illusion of that uh, artificial intelligence. And so then if we're thinking about 
artificial intelligence and what, what might become of it. It's also, as an artist, I think one of the more important things is to think about what it is to be human and what would separate us from machines and so forth. Because there's a lot of, uh, right now, the impulse is to kind of look at how we can be quantified, but I want to look at how we can't be quantified. And one of the things that's really wonderful to me is the ink blot. And it's been, you, people probably know about the ink blot because of the famous Rorschach test, which I think was in the 1950s. And, uh, but, but before that, if you look at there's some antecedents, there was a parlor game that uh, was designed called The Ghost of My Friends, where people would sign a piece of paper with an old quill pe ink pen and fold it together and open it back up, and it would turn into a kind of figurative form. And so if you look back, people like uh, even Da Vinci was fooling around with ink blots. And of course, the wonderful Andy Warhol, who you can see, I think it's still up at the Whitney, has ink blots. And so I wanted to kind of look at ink blots because what it seems to me that, that what separates us from machines, and I think, and I value more and more, is uh, creativity in general. And of course, machines can do things which are creative, but I think that they'll never really be able to replace uh, our, our collective creativity. And um, what, what it is to dream as a human and what it is to uh, invent. So these pieces, you know, as I mentioned in the other room, I always think about you completing the artwork, which probably a lot of people say is, is their strategy, but I, I kind of believe that in a lot of ways, that what separates uh, art from popular culture is that in this institution, your, your opinion and your point of view is valued, whereas if you go down the street to see uh, Midsummer, which I'm going to do really soon with my son, uh, they don't really care about your opinion. You're just there for a roller coaster ride. And the difference between pop culture and art is that, that you're, in, you're part of the picture. Like, the work really doesn't exist without you. So these pieces, these Rorschachs, um, or ink blot pieces, are about kind of trying to provoke your imagination in a literal anatomical way and, and, a, and a figurative poetic way. So we experimented with, uh, with this one is projected here, and these obviously have video uh, screens embedded in them. And so these are, I think it's maybe one of the first times they've been shown in a group uh, anywhere. And we're excited to have them here. So I think I'll leave it at that in here and ask people to uh, if they have any questions. Yeah. Uh, does your, your embedded screen Picture, does it have all those colors? Like, do you see works of the video sort of into the template of it, or do you, do you uh, are you using gel or any other kind of? That's a good process? question. Uh, so, just a technical, technical question about how these were made, color-wise. Um, we, what I would do is actually there, there are two different panels, mm -hmm. so. There are two different panels that are prepared like a painting. And so I put paint on them and fold them together and open them back up and hope that I get an interesting enough image to then cut out um, holes in it, mount screens behind it, and then work with the computer to fill those screens with uh, different images which kind of complete the um, to complete the composition so what happens is we use a computer to feed into the into the screen behind it and then place the images in it, it using a 
various programs like After Effects and uh, it's a kind of like Photoshop for the moving image, if people know Photoshop. But it's basically collage with, with um, video. This is, it's two different screens behind it, and then um, in there there could be as many as 50 different videos stuck into it or something like that, um, depending. So they're really labor intensive and. A lot of work. Yeah, it's a labor intensive process, and. Um, but hopefully. Any, any other questions? Donnie has one. These little screens, are they like phone screens or like the little camera The way these are done, oh, in, the, in there. Yeah, those are, um, I'm actually not sure what those are um, from, but they're, what their original purpose was, probably phones, but there's a, companies that mass produce those and they're sold through um, if people are familiar with Adafruit and these uh, they're, they're, they're companies that make parts for computers that are quite inexpensive to be put together for a little computer so the idea it's a, it's a great thing so somebody could make a synthesizer or a little computer with a tiny little keyboard like this big that you can use. And the idea is you can make an entire computer for like $150 or $120 that can even go on the internet. But it's also, it's, they're used for educational purposes and things, but why they made those particular screens, I, I'm not sure. Uh, we just, they're basically for the, yeah, computer, some kind of computer purpose, probably for phones and, yeah. I got, I got a question. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, just out of curiosity, because the technology that you're using, over time, uh, the perception of it changes. And take something like facial recognition and some of the other stuff you're dealing with now has a, a dark side, you know, that's not much fun are you and, and that comes over time when you look at the pieces you begin like when I saw facial recognition five years ago I, I would have had a different reaction than today are you trying to address are you thinking about the... that's a great question um, let me uh, so okay Okay, um, so the question was, what about the dark side of the technology um, and the negative side of it? Uh, it's, I think it's, a, it's really important to me that um, people interrogate the technology that they live with and figure out ways to use it creatively as best as possible. And so there could be, in a sense, a kind of meta interaction with the technology. So these scripts that I write and some of the dialogue around it has to do with privacy, with um, you know, identity, with uh, the, the kind of politics around facial recognition. But there's also another message which is important to me, which is that it's using that technology to critique itself or to bring it into a level of art and creativity. So I'm always curious about how the next generation can work with, uh, for example, video gaming and, uh, and the internet in general, because as we know, the, the uh, the phone that you have now is probably 10,000 times more powerful than the computer that took us to the moon. And, you know, what, what are people using it for? So people have those tools, but the problem is 
it's whether you use it for consumption or creation and the balance between the two. So I am interested in, yeah, yeah. So, so that's my message in the sense is that it's not really to expose the, the underside of technology because people are aware of that and there's a dialogue around it and we kind of forget. And then what I like to say is that, you know, by the time we really sort of understand one technology, we're already in the next one. So, for example, I keep going back to television, the generation of television. You know, I grew up watching more television, or my generation watched more television than they did anything except sleep. But I can't say I've read one good book about that except for maybe Jonathan Daschle's book uh, called The Storytelling Animal, which talks about, he's an evolutionary, uh, evolutionary sociologist who, has, who deals with narrative. And so he talks about how narrative works in human evolution, which is a kind of great perspective on it. I don't think he really understands art, but he had some great things to say about how uh, narrative functions and and how it's important for us to use it to kind of test things out you know he uses the example of of Grimm's fairy tales and how Grimm's fairy tales are often seen as very violent you know but he says also that kids like very little kids even a three-year-old might have very violent fantasies and make up stories but that's normal that people use that as a way of problem solving. And it's part of our evolution to kind of enact these things and work through them in a safe environment in technology. So we're evolving these technologies to connect with our psychic, psych, psyche in ways that, that we don't even know yet they're, they're happening in real time. But, that book is called The Storytelling Animal. Jonathan Daschle is his name, I think, if I have the pronunciation right. But ignore him when it comes to anything having to do with art, because I'm sure if he read like William Burroughs or A Fractured Narrative, he, he's, he's going to hate it. So we have to educate him in terms of art, but in terms of evolutionary uh, uh, sociology in relation to narrative, he's aces, you know. But I don't think he really understands what's happening now, uh, yet. Uh, I could hear, sorry, when you said the name of the company that you did the little screens from? It, it, there's a, Adafruit is the name, and um, if you have trouble finding it, you can get my email through the museum and we'll have the studio I'll send it but there's a place called uh, uh, I can't remember but yeah Adafruit yeah okay eight like Adafruit like you ate an apple so it's and I just wanted to jump in because I think because the opening's starting we're, oh okay yeah, we're starting to lose I just wanted to thank everyone so much and thank Tony I'm Andrea Grover I'm the director here at Guildhall and I think we can continue talking with Tony in a more informal way since people are starting to arrive for the opening so thanks Andrea